All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. A lot to talk, a lot to do today. Uh, actually, what I wanted to start out with was, so we are kicking off the project, and that's definitely what we're going to use the bulk of today for. However, I, I wanted to start off by talking about something in the news, because you all are on the, the verge, on the threshold, you're right there, where you can kind of understand from a programmer's perspective what's happening with stuff in the news. Uh, open, that isn't what I wanted to touch. So let's go to news.google.com and let me type open SSL. Is anyone, anyone seen this thing? Open SSL, heart bleed. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about what's happening with that. So, uh, let me see, what is it showing here? All results for OpenSSL. Yeah, so it, it's uh, been going on for several days now. Um, in the old days, when I, I started programming, the way you would communicate with another computer was, uh, the predominant way then was something called Telnet which would simply open up a connection with another computer and you could actually log in just like we do with SSH. The, the difference was that there's no security to it at all. So if someone was able to, to quote listen in or otherwise pick up on your the signal going between the two computers, uh, which isn't as hard as you think, if you, particularly if you have administrator privileges, you can basically look at the traffic coming over any wire that's going into the computer, uh, to put it in generic terms. And since it wasn't encrypted, you could see the person enter their ID, then you could see them enter their password, and you could, in essence, see every keystroke that they're doing, and then along with what the computer's sending back. So as we get more modern, we see the need for security. And so uh, one of the standards is uh, this idea of a secure socket layer. Socket is a term used to... Uh, a technical term used to describe uh, the software technology that's used to communicate between two, two computers. What you do is you open up a, you open up a socket on the other computer, you have a socket on your computer, the two sockets connect and that's what you send information across. So that's where this, the word socket is coming from. <clears throat> and if you continue, assuming you continue through the program, uh, you'll you'll get exposed to sockets in various classes, probably most of all in uh, a systems programming class. You'd certainly get it in maybe some uh, network-based classes. But uh, so op open or SSL, I should say, not open SSL, secure socket layers uh, just provides a, an encryption layer. And the way that the communications across the internet, and in fact, the way a lot of software architecturally is developed is in layers. So on the internet, at the lowest layer, you have the actual physical connection of wires. And then you've got, essentially, you have seven different layers of software that sit on top of that. And depending on the nature of the communications, uh, you need to work with a particular layer. If you're a web programmer, uh, with these seven layers, you would end up on the top layer. And why the importance of layers? Because um, way down, for example, way down low, hardware is actually different from computer to computer. So there has to be different kinds of coding that's done. And if you put it in a layer, you make sure that the uh, the interfaces are the same. And so we talked about interfaces with regards to classes, right? All you can do is random is create it and get. All you can do with the night is create it, call, wield, tell them to get off the horse, ask them if they're exhausted, right? These are the interfaces and those are the only things you can do with it. Well, if on a layer you make all the interfaces identical, then it doesn't matter if the code underneath is, underneath is different because it's a different machine. Uh, because the interface is the same and all the code that sits on top of that layer is the same. And then likewise, as you build up in layers, uh, there's an interface that's the same. So a secure socket layer is just that. It's a layer. What they're doing with secure socket layers is they're saying, I am going to provide you a means of communicating with two computers securely. 
and we'll use encryption and all that. And the joy of it is you don't have to worry about it. You just make that connection, start talking, and we will handle all of that scrambling of information at the layer below. Okay. So a uh, secure socket layer is used a lot in web communication. So looking at, I, I don't know if you can see it, the type may be a bit small, but you have HTTP and more and more now you're seeing HTTPS. The S meaning that this is a secure connection, meaning by me browsing this web page, uh, everything that's going back and forth between me and Google is encrypted. So people can eavesdrop but they'll just see garbage. And so OpenSSL is one implementation of this standard uh, layering technology. And they have provided something called a heartbeat. And one of the things that can happen when you establish a, a connection is that it can drop. And if you're in the middle of a transaction, so um, it's, it's hard to think of examples because the web has become so good at making everything transparent. Um, oh, I don't know. When you, it, it, the analogy isn't quite perfect, but when I get onto Amazon and I purchase, I put something in my cart, I may walk away from my computer for an hour and come back and that stuff is still sitting in my cart. And there's a lot of magic that happens for it to know that it's me that's communicating with it and it's my cart and it's not some guy in Kentucky, his cart, right? There's a lot of, and so there's, a, a, again, the analogy isn't quite good enough, but they have to keep a persistence in that connection so that they know my connection from my computer is connected to that connection on Amazon's computer and that way they're able to determine that's my cart. I'm telling a little bit of a lie, but uh, that's the idea. Uh, probably a, here's, a, here's a better example. When you log into Jaguar, has anyone logged into Jaguar and come back and that connection's dropped after an hour or so? Okay, this is what heartbeat, the heartbeat extension solves, is uh, these connections tend to drop if they're not maintained open. So the way that you could keep your secure, your SSH uh, interaction with Jaguar open is if you had at the underlying layer a heartbeat sent every, periodically, every few seconds or once a minute or something like that. And what happens is these protocols see that there's communication going back and forth and they don't say, hey, nothing's happening, I'm going to shut everything down. So this idea of a heartbeat keeps that connection open. All right, so uh, that heartbeat is built. Of course, the secure socket layer is taking care of everything. The idea of the heartbeat is, uh, let me get my pen. So if this is us here, uh, this would be a secure socket la uh, layer uh, version 3. There have been several versions of it record. So again, this is something that that secure socket layer provides in the form of a consistent interface. And it, it's complicated, but the only thing relevant to our discussion is uh, how much and what. So for example, uh, let's say I want to send a date across where a date is just a day, month, and year. And if we assume that a day, month, and year is three integers. So day, month, year, three integers. And each of these integers takes four bytes. So if I wanted to send a date across, what I'd have to say is I need to sell, uh, send 12 bytes across and then the day, month, and year would be encoded in this portion here, right? And so what happens is this information goes from our RAM, it gets what is called serialized because we can't have it as an object sent to another computer because it's in RAM and the limits of RAM, random access memory is the physical computer I'm on. So it's uh, a technology called serializing which basically turns this into uh, an electric signal that can be sent across a wire. And then that, that information appears on the other end and the rever reverse the process. SSL will then take that stream of information and expand it back into the, the memory of this computer. So what it'll do is it, it knows that the first, oh, let's call this eight. So it holds a really big number, eight bytes. 
it knows that the first thing that will come across in an, in an SSL3 record will be that how much information. So what it does is it reads in those eight bytes and uh, it, it puts it into RAM and it finds it out that in those eight bytes is 12 bytes are coming across for me. Yes? Is this making sense? So I get that 12. Now I know that I need to allocate 12 bytes of memory in RAM. So what I do is I allocate 12 bytes of memory. And now I just read in the, the 12 bytes, in this case the day, month, and year, and they fit perfectly inside there. Okay, That's what Secure Socket Layer does for us. So what the Heartbeat extension does is uh, it's basically doing it's just sending something simple and all you got to do to send a heartbeat is in the how much you say one and then who knows what the byte is it doesn't matter what it is okay well excuse me let me let me uh, rephrase that if I need to send a heartbeat all I do is I send one byte across so in this field I have a one and in this field, who knows what the byte is? And the point is, it isn't important. You just need information to go back and forth. And what the heartbeat does is it sends it across. It expands over here. It reads the one. It says, aha, I need one byte. Sets aside the one. Who knows what's in it? It doesn't matter. And then it sends it back. Okay? And the, the process reverses. And that's the heartbeat. Thump, 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 thump. Every few seconds or every minute or whatever the frequency is, it gets that communication back and forth. All right. Here is the problem is uh, those folks who implemented OpenSSL didn't just give one byte to the SSL3 record and let it handle everything. What it did is it gave it a more complex structure, which in and of itself isn't terrible, but it, it kind of mirrored this structure. It said, how many bytes in my heartbeat? So how many, I'm going to say H, H many, and then the data. So, uh, if I'm doing the heartbeat, how, and I want to do it the way I've described it, this would be my, my heartbeat structure. Okay, so structures are in C, and if you look at it, it's an actual C structure. It's exact, imagine, a C imagine a C++ class without any member functions, right, like private data. So, there are two pieces of data, a number for how many pieces of how many bytes are in the heartbeat and then the actual data. So the way I described it, if I wanted to create a heartbeat structure, I'd put a one here, I'd put some random byte here, and then I would give this information right here to the secure socket layer, right? Now, what I've circled here, the amount of information is the size of this number and this right here. And the size of this number is um, two bytes for the heartbeat. It didn't need to be big. But in generally, people only put one in here and they have a piece of garbage information here. Now they give this to the secure socket layer record. So how many, how many bytes total are here? Uh, if the number is two bytes. I have one, two for the number and then my random byte. Right? So three. So now when SSL3 takes it over, what it does is it says how much is three, and then my three bytes sit right here. Again, this is, here's two of them, here's the third one, yeah? Goes across to the other end, and then the secure socket layer then sees the three first, and um, creates three bytes to, to hold this one, this one and this byte right here. All right, so first time I've tried to explain it, I could probably do it better if I did it a second time. But here's where, here's where their implementation is buggy. When they receive this over here, they don't look at the number that the SSL3 record is giving them. They look at the number that the heartbeat is giving them. So what they do basically is they know that the, the, this first chunk of information is uh, from the SSL3 record. So they read in that chunk of information and ignore it. 
because what they do is they immediately jump to this. So they eat up that, they don't care what it is, and they look at this, and they see, aha, there's one byte, or there's, they read in these two bytes, and look at the number, aha, there's one, then they read one more. Okay. So let's write a tiny bit of code for that. This was a, a bug, or this was uh, malicious code. That they it, it is a bug that was used that can be used maliciously to take advantage of it. So I get a message coming in on the wire. Uh, step one: <coughs> read in SSL three record size and ignore. It. Second step, read in the heartbeat size. Allocate enough memory to hold the heartbeat data. And now send it back. Uh, allocate enough memory to hold the heartbeat bait. Copy in the heartbeat data. And then once you have it, then remember the heartbeat's both directions, so you send it back. All right. So here's the here's the key bug, right? Uh, right. I'll put it on a separate line. This is naughty, 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 naughty. Okay. Because the SSL, this is at a layer below, a layer below, right? It's always correct if. This, and it doesn't matter what this payload is. If this payload is 1,000 bytes, there will be 1,000 written here. If this payload is 3 bytes, it'll put a 3 here. Here's the problem is someone can lie on this part. Now let's say I do this. So let, uh, let me erase this and rewrite it. This is our heartbeat code. So I'm running out of real estate now. Here's the structure. Let me go back to blue. Here's the even better. Let's go to gray. Again, here's the structure. It's how many, a number sign, and then the data. I, as a programmer, don't have access to this layer. I, however, as a programmer, I do have access to this heartbeat because it's an extension that sits on top of SSL3. So what I do is I lie and I say I've got 10,000 uh, 10, bytes of data that are coming. And you know what I give them? I give them one byte of data. So what happens is SSL3 encodes it as, aha, you've got three bytes. You've got one by, two bytes for the number and one byte of data, right? But I've lied, and I'm giving a, and I put the number 10,000 in here, and only one byte. So my three bytes go across the wire here. Here's the number 10,000, and then here's my one byte. But here's the key step: allocate enough memory to hold the heartbeat data. Where do they find out the size of the heartbeat data? Did they ask for it from SSL3 record? SSL3 record said there are three, which would be one, two, and three. No. They read it from this information here. So if I'm told that I need enough room to allocate 10,000 bytes, you have to allocate 10,000 bytes. Now, we, I haven't talked about C memory at all, uh, but there's a command called memory alloc, and you literally just provide the number of bytes that you need. So this is different than saying, like, new integer. Uh, the equivalent of saying new integer in C would be to say malloc, assuming a four-byte integer, I'd allocate four bytes for that integer, right? Now, I've done this many, many times. I've, dr I've brought up this railroad. Now, let me ask you a question. And what they're going to do is they're going to allocate the memory, and they're going to copy in the heartbeat data. So they allocate 10,000 bytes, and then they're going to copy in that one byte. Now, what's in all this memory right here? Whatever was in there before. And, and what program, and what quote-unquote application is running the secure socket layer? 
program. And what's in the memory of the secure socket layer program is all sorts of things like IDs and passwords. Anything that has to do with the security can sit in there. All right. So because of this bug, these hackers put a large number, and what happens is they send their one byte across. They get 10,000 bytes back, and 9,999 of those bytes is internal memory of the security layer on that other computer. Yes? Is that one like a key logger? No, it's not like a key logger. Because, uh, 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 so it isn't perfect because what they don't have control over it is they don't have control over where this memory is allocated, right? Because it just allocates it wherever the memory is free. But as we've seen in some of the bugs, it reuses memory all the time. So what it's doing is it's using this chunk of memory to do some sort of credit card validation with someone. It's done with it, releases it. Now this bug comes along, reallocates that space, and it sends it back to this person who's doing bad things. Or it's total garbage, right? It's a crapshoot. You don't know what you're going to get back. But you're a, you're a hacker. you got time. You just run this thing all day and all night, and you're getting gigabytes worth of memory back, a lot of it repeating. But, you know, there's probably some juicy stuff in there. Okay? So my, I apologize. My, my presentation wasn't as refined as I would like. Um, but I hope that gives you an inkling of what I mean by the biggest headache for programmers is memory. Because this bug was checked into the code uh, for, S for uh, OpenSSL in 2011. So this bug has been around for, what, three years? And security researchers have just discovered, here's the big question, did any bad guys know about it? Because the bad guys wouldn't broadcast it if they found it, right? And the bad guys are definitely looking for stuff like this all the time. Who knows? So that's why you got all these news stories saying, don't use anything. Don't use Yahoo, don't use Google, right? Uh, if you have any sort of passwords, change it, da 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 da, da. In practice, the chances of you personally having lost some information to some malicious person is very, very slim, but the possibility is there. And here's the worst thing, is once, the, once this has been announced, assuming 99 or 100% of the bad guys, if they didn't know it, what they're going to take advantage of is the fact that some people are slow to fix their computers. Okay? And in fact, so they're... they're thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Windows computers that are infected with various viruses right now. And the reason setting aside the issue as to whether or not Windows is secure, uh, Microsoft does keep their operating system up to date. So when they find a bug, they fix it with a bug fix, right? And the idea is you as a person running Windows, you go get updates regularly and update your computer. So if you have an updated Windows machine, then you're immune to almost all the possible malicious things like this that can be done. The problem is there are millions of people out there don't know anything about computers. They just turn it on to compose their email or write a letter in Word, and they haven't updated it in five years or three years or whatever that is. And, and so all these people have seen all of these kinds of bugs over the years being broadcast, and they're infecting computers that aren't being kept up to date. And that is exactly what's going to happen with this bug and, and web servers out there that aren't updating. All right. Any questions? I hope I left you with a feeling of being afraid to leave the house. <laughs> That's right. Leave your phone at home. All right. Uh, so let's do a radical shifting of the gears. As I I, I made a a mistake in that. Uh, yesterday, I opened up the Project 3 folder, and I put a new item up there with the project materials, and, but I inadvertently left the item on below, which I hadn't updated yet. So I had a link for getting the project construction materials, productconstruction.pdf, and let me ask a question. Does anyone, does anyone have a hard copy of this? Okay, I want you to look at the revision on it. Does anyone have it that says version three, version something 2013? 
If you have version 2014, you're good. Does anyone have version 2013? You do? Yeah. All right. Uh, your second sheet is no good. I've got a replacement second sheet for you. You can come up and grab. And because I am feeling very generous, I created 10 copies of this project materials, of these project materials. So what I want is I just, I want people to like stampede over each other to grab these because it's first come, first serve. Not so much stability. Uh, there are two sheets here. Make sure you only grab two sheets. <coughs> That's... Okay. <clears throat> so I, I have folks in varying levels of being prepared for this. Several of you have not looked at this at all. Some of you have looked at this. Uh, what I want to do is I want to spend the next 15 minutes, so I've only got 20 minutes left in class, 15 minutes, I want you, if you haven't read it, read through it quickly, join up with folks, start thinking about everything. What are the classes that you think this has? What is the data that each class has? Even think about member functions a little bit. Uh, what we'll probably spend most of Monday doing is sequence diagramming, uh, but to the extent you can experiment with a couple sequence diagrams right now, that'd be fantastic. The final five minutes uh, we will get kind of a sanity check on what you think this is all about. Okay? All right, uh, so we don't have a lot of time to talk. Let me answer the one question I got while this thing wasn't recording, which was, what does pipe delimited mean? It means that, whoops, where am I? CD, I want 2014-04-11. Project 3 notes. This is actually Project 3 and Project 4 you're looking at. And then I'll write Project 3. Uh, what will happen is I'll give, ultimately when we figure out what we need to code, I'll tell you what subset to code for Project 3, and then the balance of it would be for Project 4. Uh, what is pipe delimited? So the question is, Delimited. There. The question is how to store data in a file. Uh, there are a couple ways of storing data. One is with fixed length records. Generally, you have things stored in records like series of names, addresses, and phone numbers. Each address, name, address, and phone number is a record. How do you separate the fields in that record? Uh, one it, way which uh, you don't see a lot anymore, although you do see it with uh, underlying some database technology, is fixed length fields. Which is that, the, say, the first 30 characters is the name, and then the next 40 characters is the address, and then the next three characters is the age. 
And this is what's nice about fixed length field is that if I tell you I want you to go to the 100th record, all you have to do is take 30 plus 40 plus 3 and multiply it by 100, and that's how many bytes you have to jump down in the file to get to the 100th entry, right? Very, very nice for getting accessing different parts of the data quickly. Uh, we're dealing with delimited fields, which means we don't know necessarily where in the file we can't do any math to figure out where one field end, where one record ends and one begins, uh, but it's more efficient in storing. So, for instance, up here, even if my name's Todd, it's going to take up 30 characters. Whereas in a delimited field, it's only going to take up as much as it uses. The question is, what do you use for the delimiter? Uh, what's being used in this case is the pipe. There you go, that's where I grew up. Uh, and so you can see that, it, what did it say? The fields are pipe delimited and each record ends in a new line or something like that? Yeah. All right, so then this would be Mark, my brother also lived there, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's how it looks in the file. And also, you have access to the data files. I have a gzip tarball in there. Grab that. It's got the data files in them. You can look at them over the weekend. If you want, if I told you to do one thing coding-wise, it would be to write code to read in those files and print out each field. Okay, and it's going to require a little research on the web. Uh, my website, where I had the tutorials, also have tips and tricks on input and output in C++. That includes a couple of sections in there on how to read pipe delimited files or delimited files. So you'll want to go there and look at that. Uh, the, it's this kind of little detail that makes this project take a long, long time. So if you nail that over the weekend and you're able to read in these files and print out the name is, the rank is, that kind of thing, then that's going to make you uh, light years ahead uh, for when it comes to coding up the rest of it. All right. Uh, any other questions on regarding this? Secret word. Secret word is again. I switched from. I've switched from uh, obscure words to arcade games from my high school days, and another another one which I remember well, is Dig Dug, huh? Let's put it together for Dig Dug, all right, okay. Uh, and it had a fairly realistic objective. Um, you had to eliminate underground dwelling monsters by either inflating them with air, with an air pump until they explode, or by dropping rocks on them. So, makes sense, right? Okay, all right. This is 1982, yeah, early 80s. <clears throat> Prince of Persia, yeah, Prince of Persia originally came out of Bruderbund, uh, a company that I worked for, by the way. I, while I, I met, um, while I was uh, in high school, I frequented this video arcade, and the manager, assistant manager there, got a job running Bruderbund Software's QA department, and. Uh, so he hired the people that he knew and trusted at the arcade he hired to be his testers. So I tested for the software company. And when it first started, it was five computers up in an attic. And by the time I left, it was probably a room five times the size of this classroom with, you know, just 200 computers for testing various configurations of their software. And so Prince of Persia was one of the software products, but it would have come a little later when they had grown bigger. Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to remember. Um, I might have done a little testing on it. I certainly wasn't a primary tester on it. Bruderbund. And then they, they wrote their O with a slash through it. With a diagonal slash through it. So they, they exist no longer, but... Another one of my favorites was the... 